Hello, recruit, and welcome to Ash Junior Academy 106 Basic Transportation. You know, for a minute there, it looked like we would never finish with research and printers, but here we are. In today's course, we are going to investigate the features of some of the more basic land vehicles. In next week's Astroneer Academy, you will be introduced to the compass and how to use it to navigate, along with augments and other items that could be used with the vehicles we will introduce today. Let's get started. Up until this point in Astroneer Academy, your only way of getting from place to place has been by using your own two feet. That's fine and all because a pudding filled spacesuit definitely needs to get their steps in to help them stay fit. Walking is not the most efficient way to explore an entire planet, however. Not only does it take much longer to get anywhere, but you have an ever-present oxygen need. Walking is so inefficient, in fact, that carrying anything larger than a small item will cause you to walk slower and extra large objects, they'll stop you in your tracks. That isn't to say there aren't ways around those speed limitations. And this rather long pro tip, allow me to introduce you to the idea of item juggling. Not only is this a good way to avoid walking slower, but it will allow you to simultaneously move multiple items to a location. To demonstrate this in action, I have three research items that I want to move back to my base. Typically, I would have to walk each of these back to my base one at a time, and I'd be moving a bit slower than usual because they're medium-sized objects. Instead of making multiple trips, I can begin walking and grab one, move it ahead of me, and then drop it. Then I can grab the next one, move it ahead of me, and drop that one. Then I can repeat that on the third research item. I just repeat this over and over again until I have reached my base with all three research items. It might take a bit of practice to get this right every time. I know I still struggle with it sometimes, but it really does come in handy. You can use this technique to carry a shuttle along with you as well. All three shuttles are extra large items, so typically you would be unable to walk while carrying them. Using this juggling technique, however, allows me to move the shuttle along and keep walking while I do it. Plus, it has the added bonus of providing oxygen from the shuttle. Just be careful that you're picking up the shuttle and not its thruster or anything in the cargo hold. While the juggling technique is quite handy, it does not compare to the freedom and expanded storage that you have when using a vehicle. Vehicles can be grouped into several categories. Rovers, shuttles, jet powered, rails, and the gravity globe. Today, we will only be discussing two of those categories, saving all the others for later courses. Nearly all vehicles in the rovers category do not contain anywhere for you to sit. In any other world, this would be considered a design flaw. Yet this seeming omission is actually intentional. That is because most of these vehicles can utilize the rover seat. The rover seat is automatically unlocked in the research catalog when you begin a new adventure and you can create it on a small printer using two compound. When unpacked, it is a medium sized object that you can attach to most of the rovers. Pay attention to which direction you connect the rover seat, however. The direction that the rover seat is facing is considered forward. If you place the rover seat facing inward on any rover, your controls for that rover will become reversed. If other astroneers have joined you on your adventure, you will also want to pay attention to who will be able to drive. It is possible to connect two or more rover seats to large rovers, providing transportation for multiple astroneers. Control over the rover will be assigned to the astroneer who enters their rover seat first. 
If that astroneer later exits their rover seat while other astroneers remain seated, control will be ceded to one of the astroneers who did not get out of their seats. If you are not certain how to enter a rover seat or other vehicle seats, simply attempt to interact with it and follow the prompt in the tooltip. If you need additional help, you can consult the third page of the astroneer basic section of the Astropedia. There is also a large rover seat which you can unlock in the research catalog for 2,000 bytes. You can craft it on the media printer from one compound and two plastic. When unpacked, the large rover seat is, uh, well, this is kind of obvious, large tier 3 item. The large rover seat can seat up to three astroneers. Similar to the small rover seat, the direction the large rover seat is facing will be considered forward, and control of the rover will be given to whichever astroneer enters first. There is one other item that can be used in place of a rover seat, but we'll talk about that more in just a few moments. Regardless of which seat type you use, each one will prompt the training simulation to generate a safe point when you enter. This is true for shuttles as well. Should the training simulation encounter a fatal error, which it has been known to do from time to time, you will most likely find yourself in the location where you last entered a vehicle or shelter when you reload the training simulation. Since you received a buggy as a mission reward in Astronaut Academy 105, let's start with that vehicle. The buggy is unique among the rovers class as it is the only one in this class that cannot attach to another vehicle to create a rover train. They are, however, faster and easier to maneuver than other rover class vehicles. The buggy is also capable of climbing very steep terrain. Given its small size, the buggy is also fairly capable of driving through larger caves. The main weakness of a buggy is its very limited storage. With only two small storage slots, you most likely have to rely on your backpack storage if you wish to transport items while driving a buggy. If you did not unlock it with the Master of Unboxing mission, the buggy will require 1,500 research bytes to unlock in the research catalog. It is created on the medium printer from one compound and one aluminum. When unpacked, the rover has two small tier one slots, one on each side above the rear tires, and a single medium tier two slot in the middle. Though you could use that medium slot for storage, I would advise against it. That slot is where the rover seat is intended to be placed and Without a rover seat, you won't be driving the buggy. The buggy is the most efficient in terms of power usage among the rovers class. It only consumes 0.03125 units per second when moving, and its internal battery can store four total units. You can connect a power producer or battery to either one of the small slots on the sides to provide additional power. The buggy is so efficient that a single power cell can provide enough power to keep it moving for up to 26 minutes. Those two small storage slots may appear to be normal storage slots, but they are not. They are auxiliary slots. If you need a quick refresher on activating an auxiliary slot, be sure to check out the Astropedia Astroneer Basics section's third page. You can attach a work light to this slot to light your way through the darkness while driving the buggy or you can attach a small generator to power up anytime your buggy runs low on power. If you want to make your buggy the best it can be, you will attach a horn to one of those auxiliary slots, because horns are awesome. Should you manage to flip your buggy or any other vehicle in the rover class, don't worry about it, it happens to everyone. Patiently wait just a moment for a flip prompt to appear, then simply use the controls indicated in the flip prompt and the buggy should ride itself. Be careful utilizing this on steep ramps and in caves though, as you may find that the buggy does ride itself but is also embedded with the surrounding terrain. If this happens, you'll have to get out and use your terrain tool to free your buggy. Thankfully, you can avoid rollovers in the first place due to each rover class vehicles and air controls. By default, you can control the pitch and roll of your vehicle while it is airborne by simply moving the left thumbstick in the direction you wish to pitch or roll, or by using W, A, S, and D on your keyboard. You can visit the options section of the simulation to change your vehicle air controls to pitch and yaw, however. Previously, you were able to simply toggle between pitch and roll or pitch and yaw by simply holding down the left of the four buttons on a controller or by holding down left shift. 
Many astroneers have reported that this functionality is not working properly for them, however, so your mileage may vary. For me, personally, it works just fine. Similar to all Rover class vehicles, the buggy will provide oxygen when you are near it. If you attach a portable oxygenator to one of its small storage slots, you can even create a tether network with the buggy. Large Rover class vehicles have larger storage slots, which allows you to connect a full-size oxygenator for a tether network without the power required to keep a portable oxygenator running. The next vehicle you will most likely encounter will be the tractor. If you open the mission log control panel, you will find the Moving and Holland mission. To complete it, you need to print a tractor. You will first need to unlock the tractor in the research catalog with 1000 bytes. Then you can print the tractor on the small printer using two aluminum. When you do, you will complete the requirements for the Moving and Holland mission. Head back to the mission log and claim your rewards of an unlocked trailer schematic and one trailer that you will be using in just a moment. The tractor consumes power at a rate of 0.075 units per second and its internal battery can store a total of four units. Unlike other Rover class vehicles, the tractor has a built-in seat, meaning a Rover seat is not required. The front of the tractor is home to a single medium tier two auxiliary slot, which functions much like those found on the side of the buggy. You do not have control over each of the two smaller slots individually, however. Instead, Using either key will activate the auxiliary slot on the front of the tractor. Like the buggy, you can use this auxiliary slot to activate nearly any small or medium object that you would otherwise activate yourself. Since the tractor must be powered in order to operate, you could place a small generator in one half of the auxiliary slot and an extra organic nugget in the other. This would allow you to activate the generator whenever the tractor runs out of power, recharging it in the process. When the generator runs out of fuel, the extra organic will automatically move to the input slot on the generator. We will investigate the additional augment items that you can activate via the tractor's auxiliary slot in next week's Astroneer Academy Extra course. The rear of the tractor has a single power cable plug which is used to connect the tractor to a trailer or even to other rovers, creating a train. We will take a further look at creating rover trains in just a moment. If you do not unlock the trailer in the research catalog as a reward for the Move It and Haul In mission, it will cost 1,500 bytes to unlock it. It is created on a small printer from one compound and one aluminum. When unpacked, each end of the trailer features a single power cable plug, and the top of the trailer contains one medium tier 2 storage slot. You can easily expand the storage on the trailer by attaching a medium storage or medium storage silo. In order to create a rover train, you need two or more rover class vehicles. Since you just received a trailer from the Moving and Holland mission, let's get it connected to your tractor and create a rover train. It is generally a good idea to arrange your packaged rover class vehicles near each other in a line before unpacking them. This will make creating your rover train a bit easier. If you skip this step and your rover class vehicles are not close enough to reach each other's power cable plugs, you will first have to supply power and drive each vehicle into place to connect them. Since each packaged item will display a hologram of what the item will look like when unpackaged, you can easily line them up to make connecting them simpler. With your tractor and trailer lined up, unpack them and then connect the power cable from the tractor to the power cable plug on the trailer or you can connect it from the trailer to the tractor. It doesn't really matter since power is not limited to flowing in one direction in a rover train. You can connect up to two additional trailers or rovers to your tractor-based rover train, and I would encourage you to do so. Adding additional vehicles to your rover train does not consume any additional power, but it does expand your available storage. There is a maximum limit of four vehicles for a rover train, however. If you attempt to connect any additional vehicles, the power cables will simply refuse to connect. There are other, shall we say, less stable methods for connecting two rover trains together, but we'll save that topic for much, much later in Astroneer Academy. Before we move on to the other two rover class vehicles, I want to mention that it is possible to use trailers as their own rover train. It might not be all that practical, but it can be done. Unlike all of the other rover class vehicles, the trailer does not have any internal power storage. That means you can't just slap a rover seat on top and go for a spin. You need to connect at least two trailers together to use them as their own rover train. 
The first trailer would be reserved entirely for a rover seat, while the second trailer would need a power source attached to power the rover train. As I mentioned, this is not the most practical use for a trailer since you're using up a lot of storage for just the seat and power, but it can be done. You can also mix and match most rover class vehicles together. If you want to have your tractor pulling three large rovers as trailers, you can do that. The handling may get a bit strange with some combinations, but since most of these rover class vehicles contain power cable plugs, you're free to mix and match them together in whatever way suits your needs. The medium rover is the next rover class vehicle for us to discuss today. You can unlock it in the research catalog for 3,750 bytes and create it on the medium printer with two plastic and one rubber. When unpacked, the medium rover features a medium tier two auxiliary slot on each end and one large tier three slot on top. A rover seat is required to drive a medium rover. The medium rover will consume power at a rate of 0.5 units per second when moving and its internal battery can store eight units. A single medium rover with a fully charged internal battery will completely drain that battery and stop moving after only 16 seconds of driving. You can extend that time by connecting additional vehicles to your rover train. The only vehicle on the rover train that will actually consume power to drive will be the one with the rover seat the driver is using to control the rover train. All others will, essentially, be able to provide reserve power. Power will drain from one vehicle on the rover train at a time until all internal batteries are depleted. You can, of course, greatly extend your driving time in a medium rover by attaching batteries or power producers to it. These power storage items or power producers will simultaneously charge all vehicles connected to your rover train, so you do not have to wait for them to charge sequentially. You will want to ensure that you are providing enough power to accommodate the power usage of the rover itself, along with any augments or other power consumers that will be attached to the rover and in operation while driving. Each bar on the medium rover's internal battery indicates 25% of its total storage. So a medium rover displaying one completely empty bar and three full bars will have six units of power available. The auxiliary slots of the medium rover function somewhat differently than the one on the tractor. Instead of either activation input causing both auxiliary slots to activate, they have separate controls similar to the backpack widget slots. The same control you use to activate your left backpack widget slot will also activate the rear auxiliary slot, and the control you use to activate your right backpack widget slot will activate the front auxiliary slot. Don't forget that front is relative when it comes to rovers. The direction your rover seat is facing determines which end of the rover is front and which end is the rear. The medium rover also has a power cable plug in each end, but it cannot be utilized if you have anything attached to the auxiliary slot just above it. In fact, look closely at that auxiliary slot when you plug in a cable. It automatically flips, revealing a red panel with a silver bar to indicate that the power cable plug is in use and the auxiliary slot is unavailable. If you plug a cable into the power cable slot below one of the auxiliary slots that are already occupied, whatever items that were in that slot will disconnect and fall to the ground. The final rover class vehicle to discuss today is the large rover. It requires 5,000 bytes to unlock in the research catalog and is created on the large printer from two exo chips, one aluminum alloy, and one rubber. When unpacked, the large rover features a large tier three auxiliary slot on each end and a single extra large tier four storage slot on top. Similar to the medium rover, the large rover has a power cable plug on each end. And similar to the medium rover, these cable plugs cannot be used at the same time as the auxiliary slot just above them. Any object connected to those auxiliary slots will be ejected if you connect the power cable to the power cable plug below the auxiliary slot. The large rover consumes power at a rate of one unit per second, and its internal battery can store a total of 16 units. The large rover's operation is functionally identical to that of the medium rover, just at a much larger scale. While it may be the least efficient rover class vehicle in terms of power, it is hands down the best vehicle for use when you wish to transport large objects or a large number of objects at the same time. 
How you provide power to your rovers will ultimately be a combination of personal preference and available power producers. For smaller rovers that are not using any augments, a single small generator may supply more than enough power to keep you moving. For larger rovers with multiple augments, you may find that generator power alone may not suffice. The generators themselves and the fuel required to keep them producing power can begin to consume valuable storage space. In those cases, you may wish to switch to the renewable power producers of wind and solar. Even these come with some caveats, however, as you could become temporarily stranded when the wind isn't blowing or during the darkness of night. Batteries can be employed to provide reserve power during these times. Personally, for anything larger than a tractor, I tend to rely on RTGs and QTRTGs. You begin receiving QTRTGs as a mission reward fairly early in your mission progression, meaning you can put them to use powering your rovers sooner rather than later. By utilizing these infinite power producers, you free up some storage space and you do not run the risk of becoming stranded because you ran out of power. Before we move on to our final vehicle today, I want to spend a moment discussing maximizing storage on your Rover class vehicles. Rovers are incredibly diverse vehicles that can be configured in dozens of different ways. How you configure your rover and storage will ultimately come down to personal preference and the task at hand. For example, if you wish to transport several packaged extra large items at once, a rover train consisting of four large rovers with no extra storage will be the best choice. If, however, you will be using a large rover as a drilling rig to collect resources, you will want to maximize your storage for those resources. In this case, you would attach a large storage or even one of the large storage silos to the rover, then attach your choice of smaller storage to that large storage item. As with most things in this training simulation, there is not one single right way to configure any of the rovers. If you find that your configuration meets your needs, then you are doing it right. There are several other classes of vehicles available in the training simulation, but most of those will be discussed in later courses. For now, I want to draw your attention to one very unique vehicle, the Gravity Globe. The Gravity Globe is unique for a number of reasons. While you can use it for transportation that will supply oxygen when you're near it, the similarities between the Gravity Globe and other transportation mostly end there. You cannot unlock it in the research catalog and you cannot create it on any printer. It does not contain any storage whatsoever. It also does not require any power to operate. You do not receive it as a reward for completing any mission, though it does unlock a hidden mission. The Gravity Globe is so unique in fact that some would argue it should be considered a recreational item instead of a vehicle. Those individuals might have a point, but since the Gravity Globe can be used as transportation, we're covering it today. If you can't print a Gravity Globe, then how do you obtain one? That is a good question, Recruit. The simple answer, go exploring. Gravity Globes can be found on various debris around all of the planets. Most notably, a Gravity Globe will often appear on top of the damaged spaceports you will encounter on every planet. There is one other way to obtain the Gravity Globe. If you have a trade platform, you can trade a Destronium for one Gravity Globe. We will talk more about the trade platform in Astronaut Academy 203. The Gravity Globe can be a bit difficult to control at times. It is not especially powerful, so it can struggle to climb steep terrain and will often get stuck in craters and crevices. Unlike any other land vehicle, however, the Gravity Globe has the ability to do a small jump. You simply use the same input method you would use if you were jumping while walking. Causing a Gravity Globe to jump may help you out of some situations, but you may still find yourself stuck more often than not. When you enter a gravity globe that is not currently connected to any storage slot for the first time, a new mission will appear in the mission log. Globe trotting. Completing this mission is easy. Simply point your new gravity globe in the direction of an open area and reach top speed. Don't worry, it doesn't take long to hit that top speed. When you do, you will have completed globe trotting, which will reward you with the very appropriately named Dizzy emote and 
500 research bites. Remember earlier today when I mentioned there is another item to control a rover beyond using a rover seat? The gravity globe is that item. Connect it to a medium or large rover and you can use it just as you would a rover seat. The gravity globe is a large tier 3 item, so it will take up a lot of space, but I think there's just something really cool about a rover driven by a gravity globe instead of just a simple seat. Today, you have learned about the rover class of vehicles, their power requirements, their unique characteristics, and how to optimize their storage. You have also been introduced to the gravity globe and its hidden mission. Next week, in an Astronomy Academy Extra, we will discuss augments and other items that bring added functionality to your rover class vehicles. We will also introduce you to the compass and how to use it for navigation. Two quick bites are also coming next week to tell you why you should take a tractor, not an oxygenator, to a new planet, and to help you gather ammonium quickly and easily. Until then, I'm Brandon, reminding you to keep looking to the stars.